Uh, today we have a guest opportunity uh, to have a great lecture uh, by Professor uh, Omar Usmani. Uh, Professor uh, Omar Usmani, he is a professor of respiratory medicines at uh, Imperial College, London, uh, UK, and uh, he is also a consultant physician at the Royal Brompton Hospital and St. Mary Hospital, uh, London. And he has uh, a lot of uh, research and publication in asthma and COPD and chronic cough, um, including inhalation uh, technique and devices. So we have a great uh, opportunity to listen uh, his talk today. Uh -huh. uh, this topic is uh, small airway disease is in asthma and COPD role of um, exafy particle inhalation. Uh, Professor uh, Usmani, please. So thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm going to be talking about an area that um, uh, will have lots of pictures in this one, um, but it's something that I'm very, very interested in. So it's going to only be about 20, 25 minutes, so it's not going to be longer than that. And really what I'm going to be talking about is answering this question. Does full lung treatment, does treatment throughout the airway tree clinically matter? Yeah, so this is the question. This is the hypothesis for the talk. And hopefully by the end of it, I want to present the information to you that we need to deliver drug for the whole airway tree, yeah? So the first four questions will be, do small airways matter? Is small airways disease measurable? Does small airways disease affect patient-related outcome measures? And then can we target drug to the small airways? So we've written a state-of-the-art publication now on small airways. So if there's one publication you want to read about small airways disease, it's the seven pillars. And you can see each pillar has the letter P, from pathogenesis to pharmacology to physiology to pharmaceutics to phenotyping, path to regulatory acceptance and prospects for the future. Um, and what I'm going to do is take aspects from this. So let's start. We were all taught in medical school that asthma is a disease of the large airways with smooth muscle hyperplasia, smooth muscle hypertrophy, mucus plugs, and inflammation. But the pathologists have said, wake up, pulmonologist. Asthma is a disease of the whole airway tree. When you have a patient with asthma who comes to the ER, who goes to the intensive care unit, and who dies, when you do a post-mortem, you find the same pathological features in the small airways. So they have said that asthma is a disease of the whole airway tree. In fact, it's a united airway where you have the nose, the top part, the large airway is the middle part, and the small airway is the bottom part. Now, we always think about the nose and the central part, but we don't give consideration for the bottom part, which is the small airways. So we all need to wake up as pulmonologists and recognize the importance of treating these three compartments, the whole airway tree. The one slide I've taken is from um, Kuteba Hamid. So what did they do in this study? The red bar is transbronchial biopsy of the small airways. The blue bar is endobronchial biopsy of the large airways. And if you look on the x-axis, it doesn't matter which cell, those cells are present in large and small airways. So it is a carpet of inflammation that is present throughout the whole of the airway tree. So let's move on to COPD. In 2017, the, the gold directive first mentioned that COPD is a disease of the small airways, yeah? You and I see this every day, hyperinflated patients, patients with bronchitis, patients with mucus, patients with emphysema. That's small airways disease. So let's look at the pathology. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine paper by Jim Hogg, and you can see three key things. First of all, look at the x-axis, different cells. Look at the bars going from zero to four, and you can see clearly small airways inflammation is present even in mild, mild COPD. The second point is this inflammation worsens from zero to four, 
And the third is the presence of eosinophilic information is also there, yeah, which is a hot topic at the moment, eosinophils in COPD. It's in the new GOLD 2023 directive. And GOLD zero is the old stage GOLD zero. And you know this has come back into fashion now because we have early COPD, pre-COPD, and also we have um, PRISM, a preserved ratio impaired spirometry, three new areas in the GOLD directive. And we know that disease of the small airways leads to the trajectory that you see here. It leads to air trapping, hyperinflation, decreased FEV1, deconditioning, disability, dyspnea, and eventually death, yeah? So the disease of the small airways is very important in asthma and very important in COPD. So if we have established this importance, can we assess the small airways? So these are two publications now that we've written 10, 15 years apart. The first one on the left-hand side details the different kinds of techniques that you can use. And the right-hand side, we have gone into further evolution of how um, novel techniques may help us. So you can divide them into imaging, biology, and physiology. And if we look further, this is a table that shows you on the left-hand side the different assessments, and on the right-hand side, measures of small airways disease. Now, today, time does not permit me to go through all of the different measurements, but the one area I will talk about, and you have a talk on this tomorrow morning, is on oscillometry, which I think is going to hopefully revolutionize respiratory physiology and medicine. It's been around for 50 years. So what is the principle? The principle is, is that the patient has tidal breathing, you get them to support their cheeks, you have a nose clip, and they breathe for just 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, you can get an idea of the airway mechanics. So how does oscillometry work? Well, imagine you have a submarine, yes? A submarine sends sound waves down to the seabed, and they get reflected back up. And the time it takes, you can work out the distance of the submarine from the seabed. Now imagine you have a submarine-like transducer at the mouth. It's sending frequency waves into the airways, and these get reflected. And you can work out whether the obstruction is large airways or small airways based on the frequency of your pulse. So if we explore this a little further, when you have high frequencies of 20 hertz, okay, at the mouth, you get an assessment of the large airways. But when you pulse gently and slowly at 5 hertz, it goes deeper and you get an assessment of the whole airways. So if you take R20, resistance at 20 hertz, large airways, take this away from resistance at 5 hertz, all the airways, you get the area which is the small airways. And that's the simplicity of oscillometry. So, we know it's measurable, and you'll hear more about oscillometry tomorrow. So, can we now make the relationship between small airways disease and patient outcomes? And the answer is yes. So, if you ask me how common is small airways disease and asthma, this is a study that we did with Dave Singh. Look at the red line in the middle, yeah? If you just draw this, on average, 50% of patients with asthma, mild as well, will have small airways disease. That means every second patient you see in the clinic will have small airways disease. So you need to think about whether we should treat small airways disease in mild asthma. So, does small airways disease and asthma correlate with patient symptoms? The answer is yes. This was a, one of the first studies that looked at alveolar nitric oxide. So, we talked about large airway and whole airway nitric oxide this morning. Alveolar is small airways inflammation. Now, look at the first graph on the left-hand side. The green dots show controlled asthma. The red dots show uncontrolled asthma. And those patients who had on the y-axis greater small airways inflammation had more uncontrolled asthma. Now, if you look on the right-hand graph, you can see on the x-axis, the higher the small airways inflammation, the lower the y-axis ACT score. So there is a direct correlation. And these patients had normal FEV1. They were naive, mild asthma, 
who were untreated. So the point is small airways disease relates to symptoms even in mild asthma. So let's do the same exercise for COPD. If you ask me what's the prevalence of small airways in COPD, you can see in the old quadrant of gold A, B, C, D, gold A, 50%, going up to nearly 100% in gold D. So again, even in mild COPD, patients have small airways disease. So can small airways disease in COPD relate to patient symptoms and quality of life? And the answer is yes. Look at the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire on the x-axis and on the y-axis you can see the small airways oscillometry, R5 minus R20, yeah, we just talked about it, was significantly correlated with health status and the most important point, more than FEV1. So we were talking earlier in the morning about FEV1, how sometimes it does not correlate with our patient symptoms. That's because FEV1 only measures the large airways. The small airways is a huge area, and this is contributing to our burden in asthma, our burden in COPD, so we need to think about it. So if we move on, we can assess small airways disease. So how can we now phenotype? So this is the Atlantis study. This is the Atlantis study, which is exploring the extent of small airways disease or dysfunction in patients with asthma. It was a global multi-centered study. They looked at 900 patients, 150 were controls, and they did a variety of tests. So they did lung physiology, they did pheno, they did CT imaging, they did nasal swabs, they did bronchoscopy, CT scans, bronchoscopy and biopsy. So, what was the purpose of this global study? It was to say, which are the best measurements to tell us about small airways disease? So, what did they find? If you look on the x-axis, there are a number of measurements that they looked at, and the top two measurements, that, or three measurements that came out, was very clear here. R5 minus R20 from oscillometry, yeah? FEF 2575, which we have in spirometry, that gives you an indirect measure of small airways. And also, we mustn't forget FVC. So vital capacity, VC or FVC, gives you an assessment of the small airways, the deep lung. And what they have now shown just last year is when you look at these markers over a period of one year, they correlate with longitudinal assessment and exacerbations. So exacerbations over one year in this group of asthma was associated with RVTLC, which is the gold standard for small airways disease, and if you look, the second red high, R5 minus R20. So we are now getting very solid data to show oscillometry and small airway measurements in patients with asthma correlate with symptoms and exacerbations. So we have given the evidence, can we target drug to the small airways? And the answer is yes. The problem at the moment is the inhalers you and I use in the clinic, they are very good for targeting the large airways, but they are not very good for targeting the small airways. And remember, if you do not treat the whole airway tree, then maybe this area of small airways is contributing to your patient's symptoms, exacerbation, quality of life, and therefore they have poor asthma and COPD control. So may I put it to you, maybe we should give all our patients at least the opportunity of having a treatment that targets the whole airway tree. So I did some work a few years ago to ask the question, if you change the particle size in the aerosol that a patient inhales, can you achieve two things? One, can you achieve more drug in the lungs? And two, can it go to the small airways? Now, look at the left-hand side. 1.5 is small particle extra fine. Now, this was, a, um, this was an independent study. So you can see TLD, total lung deposition, is higher. So when you have smaller particles, they are more efficiently delivered in the lung. 
and PI is penetration index. It tells you how much this aerosol penetrates in the lung. The higher the ratio to 1, the more the degree of penetration. And you can see with 1.5 small particle extra fine, 0 0.79. Now look at large particles. Look at the image on the right-hand side. And I think you can see clearly on the right-hand side that there is less TLD and there is less deposition to the small airways. Now, we use inhalers that have large particle size at the moment, six, five, four. Maybe we should think about using extra fine to be able to target the deep lung. Now, this was asthma. We've shown the same in COPD. So it's consistent data from a scientific perspective that tells us we should be targeting drugs to the large and small airways by using small particle. This is a science, this was part of my PhD. So now you have available commercial drugs that allow you to have extra fine particle. And here it's beclomethsone formotrol. So what does this graph show? In Thailand, you have HFA PMDI beclomethsone formotrol, 106 in the PMDI. You don't have the dry powder inhaler at the moment, which is the next inhaler. But if you look at the blue bars, this gives you the x-axis different combination of ICS larva, and the y-axis is the different in particle size. Yeah. So again, you, not every inhaler device is the same particle, and extra fine is only available with one company through um, Beclomethsone Formotrol. So if you ask me, if you use these devices, what is the deposition in the lungs? And it follows the science. You get efficient total lung deposition, and the drug is able to target the large and the small airways. You see this in the pie chart, yeah? So the devices we have that we can use follows the science. Now, if I just talk to you a little bit about the dry powder inhaler, next inhaler, which we have in the UK and other parts of Europe, and I'm sure you will get, the key thing is, is a lot of us use dry powder inhaler devices, yeah? But we don't recognize the inspiratory flow is very important to activate the dry powder. Now, with the next inhaler, if you look at the x-axis, this shows different flow rates of patients. And if you look at the y-axis, it shows you a horizontal line. What does that mean? That means it doesn't matter what the patient's x-flow is. You will get consistent dosing. So for me, this gives confidence that if I give this inhaler to my patient, it doesn't matter if they're running up a hill or exercising or resting, their flow rate is changing, you will get consistent dosing. Some dry powder inhalers require you to have really high flows, yeah? And some patients who are elderly cannot achieve the flows from dry powder inhaler devices. So this was an article just published a few years ago that actually said, provocatively, dry powder inhalers are contraindicated in the very young, the very old, and the very ill. Why the very ill? Because you are breathing very fast at two o'clock in the morning and you are desperate to get some medication. You don't have the energy to activate the inhaler device. Why the very old? Because they struggle to generate inspiratory flows. And in the very young, we know in certain guidelines, under the age of 10 or 12, you use a meter dose inhaler and a spacer. You tend not to use a dry powder inhaler device. This is quite important. It gives you a table of the different flow rates required from different inhaler devices. And with the next inhaler, which is extra fine, dry powder inhaler device, you can see it requires a low flow to activate it. And it brings me to this work that was done by Professor Teresuk, who actually looked at different peak inspiratory flow rates. So what did they do? If you look, they looked at patients under the age of 60 and patients over the age of 60. And they gave them different inhaler, dry powder inhaler devices, and they used the peak flow um, in check dial. So this is peak um, inspiratory flow, yeah? In check dial, you see this machine on the top right-hand side. So what does this machine do? You change the dial. It has six different pictures. Each picture 
tells you the resistance of the dry powder inhaler. And there's also, they describe it in their paper as non-resistance, and that means there was no resistance. That is the meter dose inhaler or the softness inhaler. So what did they find? Under 60 or over 60 with no resistance, all patients can manage. So that means the resistance and the flow, each the patients can manage. So the elderly patients can manage. But they did find an important difference with a cert certain dry powder inhaler devices. So the point from this study is, is do not assume all dry powder inhalers are the same. You need to check the inspiratory flow for the dry powder inhaler device. So you have data in Thailand. So I've been using the term, we all need to be device detectives. We, in medical school, pharmacy school, nursing school, and physiotherapy school, and we've seen the professions being represented today in this multidisciplinary um, conference on respiratory medicine, all need to be educated about the inhaler device. Because if you have a patient who has an error, an error in using the device, even in the inspiratory flow, it causes a problem with their asthma control, COPD control statistically, and it leads to greater health economic burden statistically. So there's a cost to the patient and a cost to your healthcare society if your patient doesn't know how to use the device. I'm not talking about adherence. I'm actually talking about the ability to use that device. So, the next Taylor device is extra fine, and this is a really nice study to show you the advantage of extra fine. Now, look at these three different groups of patients. The first on the left hand side is healthy, the one in the middle is asthma, the one on the right hand side is COPD. Look at the mean FEV1 four liters, two liters, one liter, okay? Now look at the lung deposition you achieve consistent deposition of 55% irrespective of the FEV1 decrease with extra fine. So the point of this slide is to show you that extra fine treatment is able to overcome narrowing of the airway and still give you high levels of deposition in the lung. Now, everybody says if you have extra fine or really small particles, you inhale and then don't you blow them all out? And the answer is no, you don't. So the top panel shows you extra fine or small particles. The bottom panel shows you large particles. Now, if you look in green, this is the particle size. And in the top and in the blue particle size in the bottom, the yellow shows you the exhalation. There is only a couple of percent difference. So you retain your extra fine, yeah? You don't blow them out. And many people think you blow it out. You don't. It remains in the airway tree. And the gold 2023, initially 2019, now write the term extra fine in the gold directive. And they clearly say that the drug deposition is a function related to the extra fine particle. So it's in the goal directive now. So then in the final five minutes, I know we've got 23 minutes left, but it'll be five minutes. I'm going to answer again this question on clinical studies, real life studies and COPD exacerbations. Clinically, does it matter? Because you will say, I understand the physiology. I understand the pathology. I understand we can target. So show me data that if you target the small airways, it makes a difference in clinical studies. So let's start off with asthma. This study compared small versus large ICS larva particles on peak expiratory flow. So why am I showing you this data? Because many people said small extra fine particles, they go to the small airways, but they don't treat the large airways. That's wrong. They treat the large airway and the small airway, and you see an improvement on the y-axis with the peak expiratory flow, yeah? So small and large ICS larva improve large airway, but only small particles improve small airways. So this was looking at FVC, a measure of small airways, and you can see only the 1.5 micron was able to improve and reduce air trapping compared to the three micron on average aerosol. Now the third point 
Does small particle improve asthma control? And the answer is yes. So this was a 24-week study by Hu Shong, where asthma control was defined classically in that yellow box, nocturnal asthma symptoms rescue. And what they found was that when you have BDP fomotrol, you actually achieved a some extra fine far greater y-axis percentage of days with asthma control compared to standard size particles. So let's again repeat the equation for COPD. FEV1, large airways, yes, small and large ICS LABA improve large airways function. FVC, small, only small particles improve FVC in COPD not large particles, suggesting the peripheral action. And third, functional exercise capacity, six minute walk distance. After a year, only the extra fine improved the clinically relevant threshold of more than 37 meters. So we've done the same equation in COPD, large airway physiology, small airway physiology, and outcome as we did in asthma. So real life studies, well, we can see here, when you give this treatment of extra fine to patients in real life and you compare small to large, in the PRISMA study, you can see that actually in 1,400 patients, patients who were on that first graph here, first bar chart, what x-axis, HFA, BDP fomotrol, extra fine, the mean daily ICS dose was much lower. 311.7 compared to large particle treatment. And you can see that in the other two graphs. Yeah. So we heard about lowering the ICS dose in the talk on MART therapy by our pharmacy colleagues. Here you can see extra fine is able. Why should extra fine reduce the annual dose of steroid? It's because with large particle therapy, it only goes to the large airway. It doesn't treat the whole airway tree inflammation. So the patient comes back and says, this treatment's not working. What do we do? We increase the dose, increase the dose, increase. But with extra fine, you treat the whole airway tree, which is why over a year, those patients are more controlled. They don't ask for an increasing treatment. So that's why you have lower dose overall. And if we now look at asthma control in real life, this is a bit complicated. Look at the left-hand graph. On the x-axis, you see extra fine, 53 patients. On the right-hand side, you see um, 58 patients with large particle. And you can see 57% more were controlled than large particle, which was 36%. Um, uh, and then on the right-hand side, you can see that extra fine, reduced daytime scores, reduced rescue education, reduced asthma, compared to large particles. So what I'm trying to show you is the evidence for extra fine small particle being more advantageous than current large particle therapy. This was one of the largest systematic reviews. It was done by Sam Sanapa when she was in Singapore with David Price. And they looked at over 33,000 patients in this review. And what they showed in this meta-analysis, that was extra fine, is favored in achieving higher odds of asthma control, lower exacerbation rates, and lower dose overall of ICS compared to large particle, coarse particle. Yeah? So the systematic review meta-analysis in real life is showing that when you use this treatment in real life, then actually extra fine achieves a greater advantage than large particle. And we saw maintenance and reliever therapy by our pharmacy colleagues. And this clearly shows when you have beclomethsone formotrol as maintenance and reliever therapy, you achieve a third improvement in severe exacerbations, a third improvement in hospitalizations. And we saw earlier on the systemic cortisoid, uh, cortis, uh, corticosteroid course, a third reduction. This is a large study from Alberto Papi in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. And if we look at COPD, I'm just going to show you two graphs before we conclude. But here you can see you have ICS LABA on the left-hand side and you have LABA LAMA on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is the SPARK study, the left-hand side in the forward. If you look at the forward study, those group which had 
triple therapy. So you don't have, at the moment, I understand triple therapy here in Thailand, but those who are on tiotropium as add-on therapy to beclobethsone formotrol was superior compared to dual bronchodilator large particle therapy in reducing exacerbations. So you have the opportunity. This is the portfolio that is available in different parts of the world. I know only in Thailand you have the meter dose inhaler, which is on 106. It's approved in asthma and in COPD, and it has a license also for maintenance and reliever therapy in asthma. In different parts of the world, we have, as I've shown you, the next inhaler, the dry powder inhaler. We also have a higher dose, 206, of beclomethsone formotrol, and also um, Trimbo, which is triple therapy, is extra fine, is beclomethsone formotrol and glycoperonium. And there's been lots of discussion about um, the global impact, and really I decided to put this in because myself and Professor Arzu were talking on the ERS about the position statement on asthma and the environment, which covers green asthma patient inhalers and also pollution. And as you know, there have been some statements from the ERS on pollution over the last few months as well. So in summary, small airways are the major site of airway pathology in asthma and COPD. In medical school, we're taught about large airways. We also know about small airways and we should. Small airways is even in mild asthma and mild COPD. Don't forget that. Small airways is related to patient outcome. Remember I showed you the alveolar nitric oxide? I showed you the St. George's respiratory questionnaire? Yeah, the uncontrolled control, green dots and red dots. And we've clearly seen now in clinical trials, in real life and in COPD exacerbations, that small particles, when I showed you the data compared to large particle, give you better control at lower inhaled corticosteroid. And the one thing that we're learning from um, um, COPD is to use the lower possible dose of ICS. So I started off with the question, should we treat or not to treat? And really, I hope I've given you the evidence that really every patient we see, we should consider the opportunity of treating the whole airway tree, large and small airways inflammation. The science tells us this, and now we know the clinical trials. So on that note, thank you very much for your attention.